Lane Community College presents the Lane Peace and Democracy Conference. And, and can you really succeed in war in, in the first place? You know, is, that, is there such a thing as winning a war? We have now surpassed, surpassed the military budgets of the rest of the world combined. The world can no longer entertain the delusion that the U.S. standard of living is possible for the entire planet. I've tried the kumbaya, and we're all the same, and you know, that, that doesn't work anymore. Just as war is too important to leave to the generals, civil liberties is too important to leave to the lawyers. Women are standing up in these prestigious positions, and it's time. We live in a society that is unequal, that is unjust, that is full of oppression and, and racism. We need to commit to removal of all our forces. And a favorite law enforcement tactic is to disturb a hive and then listen for the buzz. You do not clear cut forests to make toilet paper. And then the riot police came in and told us, okay, everyone needs to stand in the sidewalk unless you want to get pepper sprayed or arrested. And the Peace Center will be an important element in making a difference for ourselves, our community, and in time, the world. And that all rights are equally important. Uh, the right not to be tortured or the right to vote is as important as the right to shelter and the right to food. The biggest threat to humanity, it does come down to massive death. Pepper spraying and shooting uh, automatic rubber bullets into the crowd, so it, was, it sounded like machine gun, and everyone was pretty scared. And our country has one out of every hundred of our people in jail. The world economic system is destabilizing. Terrorist acts are better treated as criminal acts with political implications rather than as an act of war. The need to teach peace is obvious. The need to teach people other values besides war is obvious. And if we leave it to a political party and a leader to decide whether they bring those troops home, they're not coming home. so much for coming. Um, I, I'd like to talk, I'd like to have this be an interactive session for part of it, but I thought I would begin with overview remarks on Nature's Trust and um, the crucial point in time that we find ourselves at, which many of you may know and many of you may not know. Um, <clears throat> we are at a juncture where our world is facing a paradigm shift, and we can say that with certainty at this point. What we can't say with certainty is which way we'll be going. But I think we can map out the paradigm shifts that are in front of us. And so I'd like to do that first, and then talk about one in particular that I think we can choose, called nature's trust. Um, this, has, this paradigm shift is triggered by climate conditions that we're facing that many Americans are still not aware of, but that are getting more severe and serious every day. Every day, humanity puts 70 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. As many of you know, we are creating, in effect, a greenhouse roof over our planet. It's, it's easy to imagine it that way. If you think of the greenhouse gases are molecules that trap heat. So when the sun's heat comes to the Earth, it's supposed to bounce back off the Earth into space. And what these molecules are doing is trapping that heat if you walk into any greenhouse, you'll find the purpose of a greenhouse is to heat it up inside. That is, in effect, what's happening to our Earth. So when you look at the sky, you can imagine a big roof that's solidifying every day as a result of 70 million tons of greenhouse gases that we put into it every day. Now, we've already had about a degree Celsius heating so far. This is causing massive floods and hurricanes, tornadoes, crop losses. Um, migration of disease into places that have never seen it before. Uh, we're having species migrating towards the poles, uh, towards higher latitudes in search of cooler temperatures, uh, incredible wildfires, water shortages, and <clears throat> massive dislocation of people already. 
the UN predicts and has warned nations to prepare for 50 million environmental refugees by 2010. 50 million. If sea levels rise 10 meters as a result of the, the um, Greenland and West Antarctica and other, and the polar ice caps and everything, uh, not the polar ice caps, but those two other bodies melting. If the sea level rises 10 meters, that will displace 25% of the U.S. population alone. Um, the possibility of an 80 meter rise if Greenland melts and if, West, and, and if all of Antarctica melts is catastrophic and probably not adaptable. We are facing climate thresholds that few Americans know about. We've all heard of climate in the news, but what is not told clearly enough to the population by the media is the threshold we face. If you do just two hours of research on the internet, you can get information about these thresholds from the leading climate scientists, but I'm just going to condense it for you. And then you'll see why we're at the juncture of a paradigm shift. The thresholds mean that when you get enough carbon, or I'm, I'm just saying carbon, but I mean greenhouse gases, when you get enough of those in the atmosphere, suddenly nature's own feedback loops start kicking into play. There are many dangerous feedback loops that are already being triggered. One is the oceans that used to absorb a lot of our carbon are becoming saturated with carbon. When they're saturated, they can't serve as carbon sinks anymore. And so we can't count on the oceans to absorb the pollution that we counted on before. The forests are drying and burning and dying. The Amazon forest now is releasing probably more carbon than it's absorbing. If things continue, the Amazon forest will turn to savanna, according to the leading climate scientists. So we are losing the forest as sinks to absorb our carbon. The albedo effect is a third dangerous effect, and that is when ice melts. For instance, the polar ice caps, when they melt and icebergs melt, it changes the system whereby the ice, use, the ice reflects heat back into space. Water absorbs heat. So when ice turns to water, it is melting that begets more melting. That causes a dangerous feedback effect as well. And finally, the permafrost in Alaska, Siberia, and many, many areas contains incredibly large amounts of methane and carbon. The permafrost is now melting across those areas. If it melts severely enough, it will release enough carbon and methane into the atmosphere to cause what one science writer calls an atmospheric tsunami. In other words, all these feedback effects are being set into motion. And if we don't control our carbon soon enough to a great enough extent, these feedbacks will cause a runaway heating world where even if we reduce all carbon the next day, we will not have any control over our climate or our environment. If that world comes to pass, we have what I call this collapsing and chaotic paradigm. How close is that world? Nobody really knows, perhaps. But the leading scientists have said up until about two weeks ago or four weeks ago that they thought 450 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere was the dangerous level of carbon beyond which we cannot go. And they linked that to two degrees centigrade increase in temperature. We've already had almost a one degree increase in temperature. We've got 0.7 in the pipeline, meaning no matter what we do, because of all the carbon already in there, things are going to heat up even if we were to stop carbon, all carbon tomorrow. So we're in for some more climate punishment, no matter what we do, that will play itself out over decades and even centuries. However, scientists had thought that we could limit our carbon to 450 parts per million, and that would be linked to a two degree centigrade increase. And if we stabilize that, we can save a lot of the civilization and the expectations that, that we have as a society. They, they believe if we go over that, it will not be survivable by a whole lot of people. And you know, you hear things in climate science, the end of civilization as we know it, um, the biggest threat to humanity, it does come down to massive death. James Lovelock, who is a climate prophet, who I was just talking to one person about, um, he has a very dismal view of the position we're in, and he says by the end of the century, in his opinion, out of 6.5 billion people, 
um, there will be about half a million remaining in the far latitudes of the Earth. Now, I hope he's dead wrong. And most climate scientists give us hope. But I have to be very candid with you. We are in a desperate situation. We are in an emergency, even though people do not talk about this on the streets. So how, how much of an emergency are we in? How much time do we have? The scientists now think that 450 is too high. In other words, we've got to lower our carbon down probably to 350 or below. We're 383 mm -hmm. now, and it's rising by 3% a year. In fact, our carbon's rising faster than it did, three times faster than it did in the 1990s. So the paradigm shift I want to talk about is <clears throat> the chaotic and collapsing world paradigm versus the nature's trust paradigm, which is one I've tried to develop. The chaotic and collapsing world is the paradigm shift that we are buying ourselves into by staying on autopilot in this country. Our country produces 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And really not much is changing out there. If you look around, very little parts of society are really decarbonizing. The collapsing world paradigm is characterized by these features. First, the population just allows government discretion to destroy natural resources. Remember that word discretion, it's important. We allow our government the discretion to, to allow destruction of the resources. And so we approach carbon reduction as a matter of political choice. If you call up any senator or any representative in, in the Oregon Senate or House of Representatives and talk to them about climate, they will characterize it as a political issue, which means they are approaching this problem as a political choice that we have allowed them to frame it as. The third characteristic in this paradigm is that private interests and corporate interests trump public interests, clearly. When we see somebody having um, a right to clear-cut property or a right to put subdivisions on land, that's an example of private singular interests trumping public interests, because now we need that land for a variety of reasons. The fourth characteristic is that economic activity is driven by largely extractive ends still. There's really no sensibility towards um, you know, looking at nature as an account that you don't want to deplete too much. We can just take as much as we want. The fifth characteristic is that citizens are dragged into this world where ironically, their drive towards luxury and extravagance dramatically, almost with a whipsaw effect, turns into a fight for survival. In other words, if you look at much of society out there, the American drive still is for that next gadget or that um, next uh, expedition, Ford expedition or, or whatever. That's going to quickly turn in this paradigm shift. The next characteristic is the collapse of government, the, the utter chaos that's going to result from massive human migration that's prompted by human survival needs. Now this is where um, peace really comes into play. Because if there's one thing that disrupts peace, it's when people fight for scarce survival resources. We know throughout human history that many wars have been caused by scarcity of natural resources. This is why I spent the first how many minutes in a peace conference talking about climate crisis. It is the number one threat to peace in the world long term, and we're headed right towards there. Now, when you have um, humans migrating in desperate search of survival resources because they've been ousted from the places they've been surviving for however many years, then you have a certain chaos that happens. Governments tend to become totalitarian, even in this country. There was not a lot of freedom and democracy in Hurricane Katrina. If you recall, there was martial law, and that is what governments do, and they turn into totalitarian structures. So we have that, and the, frankly, the climate scientists have been predicting this for quite a long time. At the end of the road in this paradigm, we do see the end of civilization as we know it. Now, this may seem like a very dramatic statement, and uh, maybe it's the first time you've heard it. Start reading climate science, and you'll see it's just a logical progression of events. Let me just give you a few quotes so you know I'm not making this up. Mark Linus, who's a, a very respected writer on climate, says, if we go on emitting greenhouse gases at anything like the current rate, most of the surface of the globe will be rendered uninhabitable within the lifetimes of most readers of this article. 
Mayor Bloomberg, the mayor of New York City, put it about 10 days ago in a UN conference on climate, his direct quote, terrorists kill people, weapons of mass destruction have the potential to kill enormous numbers of people, global warming long term has the potential to kill everybody. And there's a huge world security report that's been co-authored, it's very thick, you can get it off the web, it's been co-authored by a former head of the CIA, a former chief of staff, a former deputy assistant secretary of defense that describes the scenarios um, in precise temperature increase terms. The scenario associated with 2.6 degrees Celsius average temperature rise by 2040, which is, you know, 32 years from now, is described as this, massive nonlinear events in the global environment give rise to massive nonlinear social events. Nations around the world will be overwhelmed by the scale of change. The social consequences range from increased religious fervor to outright chaos. So more and more national security people are, are just coming out and saying that climate is the overall threat to peace and world security. Um, it is more dramatic and, and, and less in our control than all of the other wars you can think of. Because this war involves nature's laws. And all the other wars you can think of, which are very worthy of all of our activism, and I'm not saying they're not, but all the other wars you can think of are pretty much controlled by humans. This one is not. This is the war that is scheduled to happen, so to speak, and it's the war that we're just directing ourselves to. So as you think about your own efforts towards peace, I so urge you to work on climate issues because it's the war that is out of our control and yet it will disrupt everybody's peace on Earth. Um, I told you there were two paradigms. So now I'm going to get to the more hopeful paradigm that I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about. And that is the nature's trust paradigm. <clears throat> the nature's trust paradigm I see as the only other paradigm that, that is an option at this point. The nature's trust paradigm <clears throat> is characterized by, I'd say, five features. One, we envisioning the role of government as a trustee of all of our natural assets. Now, when somebody holds resources in a trust, imagine you had a trust account for your niece, and it was for her college education. Maybe it has $100,000 in it, and you're a trustee. You back there, you're a trustee of that account. <clears throat> This for your niece. You can't dip into it for yourself. You can't give it to him. It is exclusively for her, for her purposes. And you must protect that account. So what I'm suggesting is that nature's trust is the only other paradigm that, that we have a choice of at this point. It would characterize government as trustee of our natural resources, meaning government must protect our natural resources for the beneficiaries, which are present and future generations of citizens. And this is a trust embedded in the law, which I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> the second feature of this trust is that it re-envisions citizens, all of us, not just as political constituents, not just as people who have to get on the phone and lobby their government for their own survival resources, but rather <clears throat> it re-envisions us as beneficiaries with a property interest in all of those natural resources out there that we need for our survival. When you think of the forests and the atmosphere and the waters and the fish and the wetlands and the soils, no matter where they are, no matter who owns them on private property, you can now start thinking of yourself as owner of those resources. And you own them with me and with all the rest of us. In other words, the public has an ownership interest in all of these natural resources under the nature's trust paradigm. Does that mean you do away with private property law? Absolutely not. People, as long as they steward the resources carefully, um, can, can, can go on having the same property rights they always have had. In fact, this principle is embedded in property law. The third characteristic is that it remakes, we remake our economy based on principles of natural capitalism. For the last 150, uh, not 150, but for the last, you know, almost a century, we've been pursuing industrial capitalism. And what that does is it depletes all of nature's assets and puts the profits in the hands of singular interests. 
all of the leading thinkers, the visionary thinkers in economics these days, are promoting a principle called natural capitalism, which urges businesses to get their profits from the Earth's interest rather than as capital. So when you think about, for example, uh, wind power uh, growing by 25% in one year alone, just this last year, that represents a piece of, of industrial capitalism converting over to natural capitalism because wind power is, is completely renewable and so is solar and geothermal. Now, if we have enough natural capitalism growing with green jobs, which are very promising for youth and others, then that will snuff out industrial capitalism that's based especially on fossil fuels. And that is the way it's supposed to be. American, the American spirit of competition capitalism is supposed to um, encourage the replacement of dirty, old, um, destructive businesses with businesses that are more productive for society. The fourth part of nature's trust or feature is that we would reconfigure our, nat our international diplomacy based on a property rights structure. When we think of the atmosphere, which seems, well, spans the whole earth, and so it seems very, very broad, how, how do we know what China's obligations are, India's obligations, or any obligations? Well, when we think of the atmosphere under nature's trust, we think of it in a different way. It's not just some sort of thing out there that everybody has to try to come to the table and protect. It's a property asset that is shared as co-tenants, shared among nations as co-tenant sovereign trustees. Now stay with me here. If you owned, if you three, this row, we're a family, and you owned a mountain cabin together, property law which I teach, would impose on each one of you the duty not to waste the common asset, and it would be enforceable. And so you couldn't burn it down, you couldn't shoot a hole in the roof, <laughs> I don't know what you'd do, but at any rate, um, property law defines obligations for co-tenant trustees. So when we look at the atmosphere as a trust asset, as a property asset owned by all nations on earth for their citizens, we start bringing a framework that, that has logical sense for applying different nations' responsibilities and finding those responsibilities. Does that make sense? Okay. And then find, and so we reconfigure our international diplomacy according to that logical framework, which is a lot different from what you've seen, say, at the Bali conference. You've heard of the Bali climate negotiations where everybody just came to the table and sort of said what they were willing to do. There was no overarching paradigm of responsibility that divided the asset um, among various parties. This would, this would do that. It would divide the asset responsibilities according to the parties that own it, which is every country. And then finally, the fifth dimension is, on a moral level, we, we would reach down in a manner that transcends all cultures, ages, classes, governments of the world to this common moral underpinning that I think is shared as a premise by every living human being on earth that has a heart, so that's not every living human being on earth, <laughs> <but> most. <laughs> and that premise is the human urge to save resources or wealth or natural beauty or, or abundance for future generations. In other words, if you seek out a grandmother from any country in the world, I, I would bet you you would find this urge. If you seek out parents across the world, you would find this urge. And so Nature's Trust draws upon this, this unifying moral urge that doesn't divide itself on religions or on governmental bases. It's, it's a, a unifying moral principle. So how do we uh, choose this paradigm? It obviously must sound better to you than the collapsing government paradigm, I, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, if we want world peace, we have to make this paradigm happen. And we have to act today and tomorrow and every day thereafter. We're in it now. Um, we can choose to ignore it, but on autopilot, the other paradigm takes hold. And it takes hold so quickly, you're going to be daunted by what I'm going to say. But scientists say we have, at most, two years to level out 
the increasing rise of emissions. Now, when we look out there and what everyone's doing, that represents an increase of 3% a year of carbon. We have to level it out at least within two years at the most. Otherwise, the leading scientists predict we will trigger those thresholds to such an extent there will be no calling back runaway climate heating. This is a daunting prospect. This means to create the paradigm that I've been talking about, we need to affirmatively act as a people. And I'll talk about how we might act as individuals you know, later. Now, I think there are two realities that are going to give us a little nudge towards nature's trust paradigm. A nudge that if enough people vocalize these principles, that they will just become very obvious to very many people almost automatically. What are those two nudges out there? Well, they're, they're maybe not pleasant ones, but one is in order to protect the atmosphere, we have to treat it as something that government is obliged to protect. In other words, citizens quickly have to come to the understanding that government doesn't have discretion to destroy our atmosphere. We have to start looking at that atmosphere, not as sort of the blue sky up there somewhere, you know, far out. But we have to start thinking of it as something that needs protection and that government must protect as part of its government responsibilities. We start to treat it as an asset, in other words, in order to control carbon pollution. Along with that, and this isn't the second thing yet, <clears throat> but along with that nudge is when you look out there on the landscape, you're actually looking at a whole lot of carbon sinks in um, the forests, the wetlands, the soils, all of that agricultural land you see around here, that the soils are huge carbon sinks. The oceans are huge carbon sinks. We have to draw down our carbon in the atmosphere by encouraging all the carbon sinks we have left. That's the only way we can climb out of this predicament we've gotten ourselves in. So we have to stop polluting the atmosphere, but we also have to draw down the pollution that exists. The only cleansing mechanisms we have are natural ones in those carbon sinks. That means we have to protect them. When you see a developer go out and, and want to pave over soils, first question that should pop in your mind is not the wildlife perhaps or the, the you know, loss of you know, land, but it should be carbon sink. You should be thinking that for every tree that's cut at this point, for every wetland that's filled and so forth. What is the second nudge? The second nudge is that we are going to lose resources, a lot of them. Under the current um, predictions, we may lose as much as 30% as of the fish and wildlife species no matter what we do. In other words, we are in for enormous climate punishment because there is this inertia built into the climate system where the world continues to heat even if we were to cut our carbon tomorrow, even before that runaway point. And so, um, you know, the scientists, the scientists are predicting um, all of the old, mature, lodgepole pine forests in Colorado and southern Wyoming will be dead within five years. They're predicting 30% of the species on this earth may be at risk of extinction within the next several decades because of this heating. Um, if you've read in the news, the reservoirs of the West are drying up, aquifers are drying up um, in Tennessee, places we are losing places, sea levels are rising. What that does, when we don't have as many forests or species or rivers, that puts a premium on what's left. It becomes much more valuable. Suddenly things have changed. We're in a different world today than we were three years ago. I mean, maybe it didn't happen that abruptly, but in our minds it's happened that abruptly. So now, every natural resource carries a premium to the public. And I think those are the two nudges that will nudge nature's trust into being because, if citizens are able to vocalize it and, and work for it, because we cannot lose any more natural resources. Now you might say, well, how can you possibly advocate protecting all natural resources? I mean, any lawyer would say that. Any environmental lawyer would say, well, how can you draw the line against any more loss? And I guess I would pose the question back to you, how, how can we carve out any resource from a paradigm shift? Can we do away with the bees and just let them go? Um, can we do without the wetlands, perhaps? 
maybe a few rivers, maybe a few of the species. When you start adding it all up, soil is just as important as sky. It's because of the reality that we've always known about, but the law is never reconciled, that all things are interconnected in nature. So when you start not protecting a few of them, the whole thing starts unraveling. So nature's trust paradigm is realistic from the natural perspective, because all of ecology needs protection to protect what we need for survival. Um, next, I would like to talk um, briefly about how we have come, why the prob why we've come to the position we're in, because I think this is quite a paradigm shift for Americans, and people in the United States are passive because we have relied on our environmental laws to protect us from these kinds of crises. Before we can move forward and achieve a paradigm shift, we must understand the paradigm we're currently operating in, don't you think? And the problems with that paradigm. Well, I've taught environmental law for 17 years. And so what I am saying is really here, here what's the word? Heresy. Heresy. Heresy, thank you. I was going to say hearsay, but that's not quite right. Heresy. Um, let me tell you about where environmental law has brought us today. In the 1970s, numerous pat statutes were passed by Congress to protect the environment. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the CERCLA statutes, the RICRA statutes, the pesticide statutes, the FIFRA, you know, all that. I can list off 20 federal statutes that were designed to prevent the problems we have today. Well, they were noble statutes and with high aspirations. On the state level, every state went out and passed just as many statutes. On the local level, we've got land use statutes and all sorts of regulations. So when you add it all up, this is the body of law I teach. The problem is, although we have more laws protecting the environment than any other nation on Earth, probably more than all the nations combined on Earth, to tell you the truth, every single one of those laws, except for you know, the Wilderness Act, maybe, and a couple others, have permit provisions. And this was a fatal flaw in each law. The permit provisions allow the agencies that implement the law to permit environmental destruction. And at every level of government, local, state, or federal, the agencies, no matter which agency you're talking about, a local planning agency, a, city, uh, a state water agency, Fish and Wildlife Service, or the US EPA, they have gotten hold of those permit systems, and they've used them to allow continuing damage to our natural resources. Over 30 years, this has brought us to nearly a dead end. The agencies, with very few exceptions, although there are a few exceptions, but not many, the agencies are not saying no. And when you call these agencies up and interview the people, you find these are good people. They're not criminals. They're not bad people. You know, you probably, maybe some of you are agency people. But they fear losing their jobs if they say no to the permit. They've issued so many permits that now it would seem contrary to agency practice to say no. They are on a trajectory where there is no end in sight except for the chaotic collapsing world because they won't say no. Now, citizens are not involved in this process very much one, for two reasons. One problem is we don't, as citizens, understand the laws very well. They are so complex and so riddled with acronyms. And I'm going to give you a little test. Okay, I want everybody to, to tell me how many of these acronyms you know, how many do you know what they mean? These are standard acronyms in our environmental laws. You should all know them. SIPs, ARARs, RPAs, BAs, EAs, MACT, BACT, LRARs, TMDLs, TSDs, SIPs, HMPs, PRPs, EFHs, ESUs. That was just, I came out with those, you know, off the top of my head. Huh? <laughs> so the agencies, those are acronyms that the agencies use to implement their laws. My point here is that these are so complex that it's a law I have to teach to law students. But citizens are completely ousted from this process. This conference is about peace and democracy. And I'm here to tell you there is no environmental democracy. Because all of the natural resources have been put in the laps of agencies. People who, good intentioned as they may be, are issuing permits and justifying these permits on the basis of language that is so confusing to the public has no end to the destruction in sight that we really don't have a role anymore. To exacerbate that problem, citizens believe we're protected. 
because we do have more environmental law than any other nation on earth, and people think it must be working. So that's the problem. Now courts aggravate this. Do you all remember, which of course you do, that our system of democracy has three branches of government? Well, that's pretty important. I always like to go back to step one, figure out what's wrong, and then figure out where people went wrong along the way. The three branches of government are designed to assure that not one branch gets totalitarian power. There's supposed to be a balance of power. So we've got Congress. Congress passed the statutes, but after that, it checked out. Congress is basically not a player in the environment much anymore. The agencies have all the control. Where are the courts? You might ask, where are the courts? You hear about lawsuits. The lawsuits that are coming to the judges are so embedded in the statutes that even these poor judges, I think, must be getting sick of these lawsuits because they can only adjudicate what comes at them. And the lawyers bringing the lawsuits are bringing them under particular statutory provisions, very technical, so the courts are tunneled down in these statutes and are resolving very minute issues when you really think of the big picture. Moreover, because all of the agency decisions are characterized behind technical language, any agency will say, this decision is a matter of, a, it's a technical decision. So imagine a judge not having any technical expertise in particular, they give deference to the agencies. Well, that deference, I can see why it started, but now it amounts to rubber stamping what is essentially a political decision. So what you have is, all across the board, instances, particularly in the federal government now, <clears throat> of agencies making politicized decisions to favor a particular industry. It goes to court behind a screen of technical language, and the courts give deference, thinking it's a technical decision. And so the decision's often upheld just on those grounds. If, it goes, if it's overturned, it often goes back to the very agency that produced that decision in the first place. So it returns the process to the same politically infirm process that produced the original decision. Did, are you with me on that? Mm -hmm. So we've got a real problem in um, the paradigm under our environmental laws. Now, Nature's Trust will switch gears, and, um, and I want to describe Nature's Trust and some of the value it has for climate, particularly. Nature's Trust would endeavor to use our entire federal, state, and local bureaucracy, because we've got tons of resources in those levels of government. We've got all our taxpayer money, all our regulatory authority locked up in government now. It would endeavor to keep, you know, take all the laws in existence, use all the bureaucratic um, power we've got, but change one thing. Change government's discretion to destroy resources into an obligation to protect resources. Now, you can make that change. It's a paradigm shift, a complete paradigm shift. But it's this, a, an elegant one, a simple one. And you can make that paradigm shift without changing one word of any environmental laws. How do you do it? The citizens have to demand that paradigm shift. Because right now, the citizens are just going about their daily lives. They have to start expecting their government to protect their natural resources. Let me read you a quote from um, Illinois Central, which is a famous Supreme Court case. It was decided back in 1892. To show you how embedded in the law this nature's trust paradigm is, it links down to a doctrine in the law called the public trust doctrine, which some of you may have heard of. Back in 1892, the, the Supreme Court said, the state can no more abdicate its trust over property in which the whole people are interested in then it can abdicate its police powers in the administration of government. So this trust that I'm talking about is basically the platform of all of our statutory laws. In other words, it was the principle in existence which Congress drew upon to then enact all of these statutes. But it has been so covered up with all of the statutes and regulations, thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages, of statutes and regulations have covered up these basic principles and have basically been geared towards supporting agencies and issuing permits. You see how that can happen? It's almost like a forest being overgrown with ivy. And if you uncover the ivy, if you tear out a little bit of ivy, you can see some native plants growing. That's almost how we could think of 
this trust doctrine. It does, it's embedded in the law. It's a legal principle, it's not fiction. How does it relate to private property rights? Um, this is one of the most important features of the trust doctrine. How many of you may have had kids or may have played with a kid, and I may get this title wrong, but there's a game out there, rock, paper, scissors. You know that? Okay, for anybody who doesn't know it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know you do rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, rock, we could do it, yeah, come on up, come on. Okay, so this is how this works. This is a very important lesson in environmental law. Okay, okay. Rock, paper, no, you come to me. Okay. Okay. You do. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. I cut you. Uh -huh. Hot. Okay, now, every time she does paper, which she did like that, if I do scissors, uh, she's out of it. She's, yeah, I win. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. And there's the other time I win. When I'm the paper and I squash her rock, mm -hmm. then I win. Every time. Okay, you can go back. Now. <laughs> now, how does this relate? I wanted to wake you up with this. How does this relate to what we're involved in in environmental law. It relates to the property rights aspect of nature's trust and private property rights. When you go into an agency with a permit that you want, and the permit is to, say, destroy a wetland or use up some farmland, whatever it is, you're going in with your property rights as a corporation or an individual, your private property rights. What is opposite from those property rights are public resources, but they're not characterized as property rights. They're characterized as just sort of resources out there. The air, the water, the fish, the water, nobody really owns them. They're not characterized that way in the agencies. So the private property rights always dominate. They are always the scissors that cut the paper because nature's assets are not characterized in property terms. Do you see how that works? So the clear, more tangible property rights prevail. Nature's trust paradigm changes all of that and it puts scissors to scissors, paper to paper, rock to rock because it characterizes all of, the, all of the assets out there, all the resources, as natural assets owned by the public. We have a property right in nature's trust. So the paradigm shift is that when you line up property rights to property rights, the agencies really no longer have a justification for issuing these permits because they're more damaging usually, at least in this new world we live in, to public property rights than beneficial to private property rights. It's a very important change to make in our minds. Environmental lawyers and law professors teach statutes. And so you're graduating almost every student in law school knowing statutes and not knowing about these common law trust principles that are actually much more ancient than the statutes and their court-made principles. Um, so it's a real effort always to get a group of law professors to, to, to look at something different. Right now there's a, a listserv with um, 200 law professors talking about the Clean Air Act case. You know, today you might have heard the EPA, head of EPA, just denied California's petition to regulate automobiles more stringently. So basically EPA is telling California it can't regulate new automobile emissions more stringently than the federal government, which isn't regulating them at all. Um, so all of, the lawyer, all of the environmental law professors are hopping on that decision, spending their entire weekend parsing out that decision. I can tell you right now, it's not going to make a difference. It is a minute point in a statute. It's worthy of pursuit, of course, but people ought to be looking at the bigger picture as well, and, and they're not. There are few law um, professors in the country that, that I'm linked in with who are looking at this, and I expect this will change as most things do, but not rapidly. Now I want to get to how this nature's trust might affect climate, and then we'll talk about how citizens um, can be catalysts for a paradigm shift. So when we talk about climate, how could we apply nature's trust principles? Well, you look at the atmosphere as a trust asset that's owned by all nations of the world as co-tenants, sovereign co-tenant trustees, which I told you about. The, the asset, just like a bank account, has to have a standard of recovery. In other words, we have to know what it's going to take to achieve climate equilibrium, right? Scientists have done that for us. They've, leading scientists have produced papers that say exactly what must be done to recover the climate. There's three things. We have to stop the growth of emissions within two years. Remember that two-year time frame. 
We have to bring emissions down 4% a year thereafter. And we have to eventually reduce by at least 80%, and now it really looks like zero, by at the very latest 2050. So I said three things. The most important of those things is clearly the two-year time frame for leveling out emissions. We have to stop increasing emissions. If we don't, we go right over that threshold into the very dangerous world scenario. So how would a trust approach do that? Well, if you think about it, and this is where it gets tricky, and maybe I encourage you to think of the atmosphere as one huge polluted circla site. Do you all know this term circla? Um, a hazardous waste site. You've all heard of polluted hazardous waste sites. Well, oftentimes companies um, pollute hazardous waste sites. And there may be 100 companies that polluted the waste, hazardous waste site. But it's a defined piece of property. The scientists say what needs to be done to clean it up. And each company is responsible for their fair share of cleanup in proportion to what they put into it. We can look at the atmosphere in that same way. We can define it as an asset. The scientists have said what needs to be done to the asset. And I encourage you to think of it as pie in the sky, especially since we like that phrase, pie in the sky, something to reach for. Well, if you think of the atmosphere as, or carbon as pie in the sky, imagine different slices of that pie that represent different nations' contribution of carbon. Well, the United States has a 30% share of that pie. Other countries have other shares. Now stick with me here. This is so important. If any nation doesn't take its share of carbon reduction, it leaves a slice of the pie there. That defeats what scientists say we must do to recover our climate. You cannot have any orphan shares. Is that principle evident? You can't have any orphan shares unless some other country picks them up, which no country is going to do because it's so hard to get our own carbon down. Nobody could pick up another nation's share. Well, you can apply that orphan share principle to the level of states in this country and to the level of every city and county. Because imagine if, if California as a whole were reducing its carbon, but one city, San Diego, didn't take action, it would leave an orphan share in California's share. So California couldn't, couldn't create its carbon reduction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I told this to, um, I was talking to a group of high school students in this remote town up there in McCall, Idaho, um, at the edge of the Frank Church Wilderness. And these high school students are, are just terrified for their futures, terrified. They know what global warming means to them. They're essentially being drafted in a war for survival. And they know it. And I told them, I said, you know, I, I mean, they're worried about their lives. And they should be at this point. They should be worried about their lives in the future. And I looked those students in the eye. And this is a town of 3,000 in Idaho. <laughs> I won't say more about Idaho, especially on camera. But anyway, and so, <laughs> and so I looked them in the eye and I said, you know, the fate of the whole planet depends on McCall, Idaho taking its share of carbon reduction. Because if you don't take your share, who on earth do you think will? And they just got it. They just got it. And there was a sober moment. You could see in their eyes, these high school students, about 17, 18 years old. And they realized, yeah, they have to take their responsibility for carbon reduction, and they have to hope Everybody in the world thinks the same way. I'll tell you, McCall's a different town now because of it. Um, they're, uh, yeah, I'll just tell you the story right now since you've asked. So after that high school lecture, a 10-year-old came up to me. I'd lectured to her class too, although not the same lecture. You have to be a little careful with younger children. Yeah, because they're not prepared for the draft. For one thing, high school students are getting to be adults. If there's a draft on the horizon, they need to know about it. They need to know in life and death terms what their future holds. But this 10-year-old came up to me, and she gave me a letter. And I knew her. Her name was Claire. And she had watched a movie, Planet in Peril. How many of you have seen that movie or heard about it? No? It's a documentary that recently played, an excellent documentary, that shows the collapse of ecosystems planet-wide. And she had seen it with her family. And she brought me this letter. She was so upset about her future and so scared. 
And the letter was to the people of McCall, her town. And the letter said that all of these things are happening and she's worried about her future. And she said, but we can make a difference. We can make a difference if we get together as families and friends and we talk about what to do and proceed to do what we talked about doing. And so I looked at that letter and I'll tell you, I was, I was leaving McCall, Idaho two days later and I didn't have time to deal with this letter, but it would have haunted me had I not done anything. So I assembled a group of about 20 adults in the community, 10 of whom I didn't even know, but I sort of handpicked them as kind of movers and shakers in the community. And I invited them for pizza. And Claire was there with her letter. And Peter and Sam, the two high school students, um, two of the high school students were there, and the rest were adults. And those kids got up, and Claire read her letter to the adults, and Peter and Sam got up and said, we need you to take responsibility for our future. <laughs> and now, there is no stopping that town. I get emails every other day about what this group is doing. It just more and more people are added onto their list. It started with about 20 people now, you know, many, many more. They're having meetings, they're going to the mayor, they're asking the mayor to sign the mayor's climate agreement to bring emissions down um, by 2010. So this is a community taking responsibility for their emissions and also taking a leap of faith that every other community in the world will do the same. It's my strong feeling and hope that we've come to this point, we're in a democracy, citizens do hold the levers of democracy still. And if we start acting as citizens and we understand this orphan share concept, it's my hope we will act on it in the same way these McCall Idaho people did. Because I think what has really hindered us was thinking about atmosphere out there somewhere it didn't have any timelines. We, we don't hold government accountable for destruction of our resources. But if we switch our thinking into a defined asset that future generations have a right to, and we acknowledge we are going into war in climate if we don't do something, we're sending all of our children directly into an unending war for their survival. If we acknowledge these things and understand there's orphan shares, the orphan shares can't be excused. Then, I have real hope for communities, one by one, taking responsibility for their carbon and this achieving a domino effect. We can't do it unless we have two things in place. One, citizens hold their governments accountable for carbon reduction as a responsibility, not as a political choice. And two, that citizens and governments know that they can't leave an orphan share. So what is the orphan share? This works out really well mathematically. If you think of a pie, and the scientists have said that pie must not grow anymore after two years, that means on every single level, mathematically, on the city level, the county level, the state level, the federal level, and the planetary level, every jurisdiction must be accountable for not allowing its emissions to grow. And then if scientists say that pie has to come down 4% a year thereafter, you go back to every single jurisdiction and you say, your emissions have to come down 4% every year thereafter. So that's a mandate that is a fiduciary obligation in managing this asset. It's the same as if you had a bank account of $1,000 and you put it in the hands of some manager he said, I need this to, well, in this case, it would grow. That's probably the wrong direction, but <laughs> grow 4% a year. You have some accountability. Now, can we achieve this? Absolutely. We have the bureaucracy, the resources, the imagination to achieve incredible carbon reduction. We can do many things without affecting any aspects of our lives. In other words, we have the technology available for the low-hanging fruit to stop the rise in carbon emissions if we just make an effort. The other, the other parts of it are not nearly so hard as you would imagine. Studies are coming out um, almost every month saying that economically it's far more efficient to achieve carbon reduction than to certainly go into this world of chaotic heating, but, but it's actually very little expense. The United Nations reported, and don't, you know, don't quote me on this, but it was reported that achieving all the carbon reduction we needed to would only cost 
we would only defer the um, growth of the economy by about half a year in, in 50 years from now. So this is something we can do, but citizens are not calling their government to action. And this is where we need to really start thinking as a group here, um, how we call our government to action. And I've got some ideas. Um, we need to have the courts accountable in part, but mainly citizens have to start acting as citizens. We've been very passive, and now we need to take hold of this moment. And if you think about it, this is our moment on Earth. We are the most pivotal generation yet to live on Earth because what we do in the next two years will determine our future. And that is a direct quote, practically, from the head of the United Nations climate team. What we do in the next two or three years will determine our future. So I have urged citizens to think about the model of victory speakers. And I'm going to close with this and then open it up for some questions and feedback. Victory speakers in World War II were crucial to mobilizing the nation in a very short time. 100,000 people came together as volunteers. And these were not people with outstanding oratory skills. These were the trusted people in the community. They were not the lawyers. They were the, the bankers, the mothers, the school teachers, et cetera, the carpenters. And they came together, and they made five-minute speeches at every forum they could find in churches, in town hall meetings, in grocery stores, PTA meetings, everywhere, to convey the nature of the threat and what people could do. World War II would have had a different outcome probably without those victory speakers because they were key to mobilizing the entire nation in a short time. We need victory speakers for climate crisis. We need as many people as we can possibly get right now to wage and to get the country mobilized behind an atmospheric defense effort. And it's a defense effort that doesn't involve killing anybody. It's a beautiful defense effort because it's probably the first defense effort in the history of humankind that is out to just save every life on Earth. But we need to mobilize the public. And I'm here to tell you, we can't do it without every one of you individually. We just can't. We need every live person who has their attention on this issue. And so people today in McCall, Idaho, in China, in the Philippines, all around the world are becoming victory speakers. And they may not call themselves that, but it was often said a long time ago that ordinary citizens in history have found it their responsibility to do something extraordinary. We now need every one of you to help mobilize a nation to save a planet. And so the thought I want to leave you with is, how can we become victory speakers for climate, wake up every day and do this as part of our jobs or whatever role we have in life? What is our role in this new world? How are we going to do it personally? Because we can't do it without not only you, but hundreds and thousands and then millions of people across this world.